Church Without Borders is our webcast and podcast, the educational series that comes out every week, and thank you, Len, for producing that. And this summer, we've been using some cartoons, comics, to dig more deeply into our theological thinking. And you may have seen some of this if you watch the daily devotionals. And if you don't, don't worry, you're not left behind here. Cartoons are this daily life experience in humorous form. And daily life is simply a physical manifestation of what we truly believe or our theology. My favorite theologians, Calvin and Hobbes, of course, not John Calvin and Thomas Hobbes, although Thomas Hobbes' work on the social contract, pretty good, right? But nothing pulls at the heart of who we are at a more fundamental level than Calvin and Hobbes with an E by Bill Watterson, right? So for Rally Day, we have this classic comic intersecting with the story of Nicodemus. This classic, because fall, the beginning of the school year, this new year, it's all about change and transformation or perhaps transmogrification. A new world, and maybe from my early days, I really knew this word transformation because of my background, but this is perfect. You have Calvin saying, a transmogrifier can turn you into anything at all. All you have to do is set the indicator and and the machine automatically restructures your chemical configuration and you can be an eel or a a baboon or a giant bug or a dinosaur and what if I want to be something else? I left room, just write it on the side, (laughs) right? It's awesome. So I knew not about transmogrification, because those comics came later, but transformation. This dictionary definition, a thorough and dramatic change in form or appearance. There's a big difference between knowing that word and what it means and really getting it, that nuance. So I could use that word to talk with my elder siblings or you know, highly educated parents, but I didn't really get the significance and the nuance of it until September 17th, 1984. That's the day that geeks and nerds celebrated because Transformers, the animated series, premiered on television. I do want to be clear that if you pay attention to this genre, I'm not talking about the live action movie franchise directed by Michael Bay. Nope, no, no. That 2007 to 2018 thing, not to be too judgy, I would never talk about bad dialogue, explosions, and CGI abominations. Nope, I wouldn't say that out loud. I would just say, stick with the first gen, would ya? So, the Hasbro Transformers, thank you so much, that chronicled this epic struggle. Y'all are with me because you're big fans, right? (laughs) So, stick with me, I'll get to the point. So, we have the Autobots led by Optimus Prime and the evil Decepticons led by Megatron. And all of this because we're fighting over the fate of the Earth, right? And it's so much fun, but as I look back on it, What I see, of course, is how this cartoon moved a generation and was this touchstone because robots could transform from this humanoid appearance into an automobile. And let me tell you, how many conspiracy theorists do you know that now think Don't trust the machines. They're going to take over and transform. This is standard genre, right? Begin to trace where it came from. They put it in our heads. So it really was educational, but not as a conspiracy theorist. It was educational because I got this clear idea of this pesky word, transformation. It's a serious 
substantive, significant change. Significant change that comes from this essential place, the self, the soul, the spirit, whatever you want to call it, because it remains intact. And transformation promises, just as the tagline says, more than meets the eye. Really, you're not Transformers fans. I totally can tell. OK. <laughs> We've returned this fall, and we celebrate transformation, a change, a new beginning. And we do so being able to laugh with Calvin and Hobbes, this cartoon that we just read, this cartoon. Because if it's any indication at all in terms of what we really believe, we understand that people for some time or perhaps all time have been obsessed with this idea of transformation. Whether it's from a car into a robot or a child into a superhero or a frog into a handsome prince, or Tony Stark into Iron Man, the possibility is that we're somehow capable of real and fundamental change. And that lies at the very heart of our human imagination. Little children want to be like their awesome teenage siblings, right? And teenagers want that freedom that comes with being all grown up, and grown ups would give anything to turn back the clock. There's a deep longing for change, and it's woven into our DNA. It is the central hope and connection in most of the world religions. There's a goal and a purpose in our faith journey. It's part of the reason we write poetry and sing songs and daydream in rainy or sunny days. So it comes as no surprise that transformation shows up as this thread that runs through the very fabric of our scriptures. The Hebrew scriptures. Joseph rises from being a slave and a prisoner to the second in command of all of Egypt. David evolves from this youngest son who should expect nothing into this poet and shepherd to the first king that collects all of Israel. Now, not the first king of Israel, but the first king that collects all of Israel. It is the promise of the prophets that you can hear as Ezekiel says, a new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. It's the power of our Christian story. As Mary, this young peasant girl, becomes the mother of a Messiah. And the apostle Paul picks up the thread and writes, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. All of these passages highlight the belief held in faith that God is at work transforming, transforming the human spirit, the human person, the human community, calling and moving us forever forward, closer and closer into this authentic relationship with each other and with God's divine love. And all of this brings us to John chapter three, which among so many more deep threads, this passage is an extended treatise on transformation. Nicodemus comes in as the student, Jesus the rabbi, and Nicodemus comes at night, and he begins to teach on what is transformation, but also how it is that we become transformed. This narrative, the what of transformation comes to us 
in true Johannine form as this question. What do we hope to achieve? What are we promised? What does Jesus say could be the result? And this gospel functions always on so many different levels, but we can enter into a few to gain insight. In this first few verses, Jesus answers Nicodemus's questions. How can a person be born again? Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. The Greek word translated spirit, pneuma, right? It's a word that can be translated as wind or breath. And since John begins with, in chapter one, in the beginning, clearly John is giving us this creation narrative. It's not a reach to believe that Numa is perfectly reminiscent of in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void. And that Hebrew word, translated ruach, right? Wind, breath, and spirit. The author of John, who loves a good Hebrew Bible throwback, has Jesus using this language of wind and breath and spirit and water to conjure these images of creation. He's talking to Nicodemus about life itself, and not just any old generic life, but life as it is meant to be lived. The Genesis story is Eden, right? This life as it's meant to be lived. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he can have it, that we can have it, that this transformation can happen here and now, this real, authentic life. And don't miss it. Because there's other places in the passage where John is talking about it. Probably the quintessential verse that you will see if you're a football fan, and today's football. So, John 3.16, right? because that's where it connects. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Everlasting life or eternal life. These are the English translations. And when we say that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we should have everlasting life or eternal life, does your mind automatically go to heaven? Jesus didn't think about heaven or teach about, I don't know what he thought about. He didn't teach about that heaven as a far, far away place. Jesus taught about this earthly kingdom of God. So very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit and what is flesh is flesh. Numa, wind and breath, Okay, and we have this understanding that this life that we are given is a whole life because the word that is translated as eternal or everlasting, this Greek word is actually better translated as authentic, whole, or real life. Christos. So very truly I tell you, you should have authentic, whole, and real life, which is the life that we have now. So John is setting forth that what Jesus is offering to Nicodemus in verse 316 is no different than what he's offering in verse 6 or verse 8 or verse 11. Life the way it is meant to be, as God intended. 
an authentic, robust, or full, whole life, a genuine life lived in the presence of God, God at the center and the source as the transformation we seek. And Jesus extends it. This is the what of transformation. To believe. Belief is a clumsy translation because belief, if you believe something, do you believe it in your head? Belief in Greek is head connected to heart put into action. So I could say, I believe in gravity. I would also respond, what's my choice? I could then say, I believe in Bigfoot. My other response would be, hmm, nice. Belief goes into action. We don't separate the two. Belief launches and shapes our lives into actions. I believe in gravity because I've fallen. I believe in gravity because it shapes the life and my actions. To say I believe in God shapes my life and the way I function. So this passage in John, the whole story of John, is meant to be taken, like the transformation story. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and asks questions. And he then leaves at night. The next time we see Nicodemus in his quest for transformation and belief, we see him in the light defending Jesus to the Sanhedrin. The next time we see Nicodemus, we see him with Joseph of Arimathea getting Jesus off the cross and preparing his body for burial. It's as if we have these little cartoon clips. To understand the story of Nicodemus, to understand transformation, or to understand transmogrification, you have to see not just the one clip, but each piece and each word in its entirety. I come in the darkness, I ask questions. Life must unfold before my faith can move into the light and I can actually live it out, articulate it to others around me, the Sanhedrin. Live it out as a true disciple with Joseph of Arimathea, in the world's darkest moment, I can respond. Here's something I can do. The Gospel of John, brilliantly written on these levels, teaches us that transformation, different than transmogrification, doesn't happen by entering a box, writing it, and coming out, but slowly, slowly, over time, in a process, moving from one stage to the next. It's not a thought process. It's thought to heart to actions, living into a way of being, discipling, transformation. It is a way of being a disciple. It is a way of living. It is all being. Living into the light and love of God in such a way that it transforms your thinking, your feeling, and your doing. So, transformation or transmogrification? Transformation. But it takes time. It is a process to move more fully into a life aligned with God. 
now and into the ever after. Amen.